I'm Nadja Saad for BizNews.com and with me today is Richard Reeves, a senior fellow at Brookings Institution and author of the book of Boys and Men, Why the Modern Male is Struggling, Why It Matters and What We Can Do About It. Richard, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you for having me on, Nadja. The way that I sort of got to this interview was in a conversation a few weeks ago where a friend of mine said to me that the suicide rate amongst males was four times that of women, and I didn't believe him. I then researched it probably to prove that I was correct, but then realized I was very shocked to see that I was wrong and that it is in fact true. Speak to me about these statistics. Is it a globally prevalent ratio, the age disparities, what can you tell me? Yeah, so, uh, well, first of all, can you tell me why you didn't think it was true? What, what what made you question it? Because of the common knowledge that women attempt suicide significantly more than men do. Yeah, so the the, the literature on attempt, attempts is a very, uh, some, it's a very difficult thing to interpret, but you're right. Um, uh, so to answer your question directly, the uh, the ratio is about the same everywhere. The Everywhere we've got data, this is true both today and historically, the male suicide rate is between three and four times higher than the female one in the US. It's close to four times higher. And the the age breakdown, but I should say there's a couple of there's some differences. In some countries, the, the, the overall rate is going down. Mm -hmm. uh, so even as the gap remains, the gender gap remains, the, the overall suicide rate is going down. So both for males and females, but in the U S it's going up for both, but with the same ratio. And in terms of age, the highest uh, rates of suicide are among middle-aged men. And as a race gap there too, actually, this is uh, one statistic where white men are actually more vulnerable. But the fastest growing rates of suicide are among younger men and men of color. So between 2020 and 2022, the male suicide rate for boys and men between 15 and 24 rose by 8%. For example, that was just in, in, in one year. And so the fastest rises are coming towards the lower end of, of the spectrum. This time frame that you mentioned, though, that's very pandemic related, though. How much of an influence do you think that that had? Well, I, I, the honest, honest answer is we don't know. Uh, the data are, are solid, but the interpretation is is hard, especially at this point. But it is noteworthy that it was only male suicide rates that went up uh, from 2020 to 2021, and and most specifically for that 15 to 24 group. Now, it looks like there are other mental health issues that are disproportionately affecting girls and young women. And so this is not in any way to say that there aren't two things going on here at, at, at once. And, and so my instinct is that the pandemic increased social isolation for lots of people. It derailed male educational journeys significantly more than female ones. So the drop in, the drop in college enrollment for men was much greater, for example, than for women. So uh, we don't know for sure whether which of those factors it is. And that's against the long-term trend of a rise over the last 10 years. So it's a spike in one year but it's against the longer term increase. Why did it affect the dropout rate of men more than women? So it affected the enrollment rate of men much more than women when the pandemic first hit. And uh, that's for a couple of reasons. One is that some of the courses that men were more likely to do than women are actually hard to do online. So they're the more vocational courses, for example. So if you think about like a, a vocational course in a community college, which is where most of the drop was. So some of it was as simple as that. But some of it also was that it seemed like more men were just like, yeah, I'm not going to go uh, mm -hmm. while all this is happening. And that's fine if they then went later. But it's mm -hmm. part of a general pattern that male college enrollment is is falling faster than female college enrollment. And especially the, the chances of um, boys going straight to college from high school is significantly lower. It's about 10 percentage points lower for boys than for girls. And that gap has really risen, even in the last five years. So there's some long-term trends here, which the pandemic just seemed to, to like a lot of the trends we saw, the, the pandemic acted like a searchlight, right? It just, it just acted to really illuminate some longer-term trends. And in this case, it illuminated this kind of growing gap in educational outcomes uh, between boys and girls and men and women, 
and it illuminated the different kinds of mental health crises that we're seeing for young men and young women. Just back to the suicide gender disparity. I mean, this feels like something that should be common knowledge and it's almost as if it's the opposite. And I went through your article that showed the CDC's interpretation of these stats and there's no mention of this being a very key insight. Why do you think that it's being ignored or swept under the carpet? Or just... um, well, I think the... Obviously, I'm speculating a little bit here, but I, I, I do, as you, as you say, I'm critical of the CDC for not drawing more attention to the data. It's their data that we're referring to here. So the best data on suicide rates is from the CDC. And they did put out the data that I've just been citing, but they did so with very little fanfare and very little publicity around it. And then you add to that the fact that there are no organizations, no institutions whose job it is to be looking for that data and really drawing attention to it. Whereas when we see some really disturbing trends among the mental health problems of girls in high school, for example, which was another CDC report more recently, first of all, that got a lot more attention from CDC themselves, but also there's just a lot of organizations whose job it is to be advocating for and looking out for the uh, problems of women and girls. And to be clear, I think they do a great job and an, and an essential one. But it also does dramatize the fact that there are no equivalent organizations or institutions for boys and men. So I, actually, I missed that data myself. And and this literally, I'm one of the few people who, who's, who does currently have this as a full-time job. Uh, and that's because nobody reported on that data. Um, but it wasn't reported on because no one was pushing them to report on it. And so the cycle turns. And I, I, I think the danger there is twofold. One is that really policymakers need to know who's at highest risk for certain health things. I think parents and just people generally need to know. I think I think if you're a parent, it's good to know that there's this fourfold difference in risk by gender for suicide. And I think that the other danger is that to the extent the figures are real and they're out there, and as you discovered, like you go find them, mm. that people who believe that society is neglecting the issues of boys and men can find pretty good data points to support that thesis from this kind of this conversation, right? And then that drives a lot of people to the right, to the manosphere, to the people who are saying, look, they don't care about you. This is evidence to support that thesis. And I don't think it's true that as a whole, that see, I don't think CDC doesn't care about male suicide. I just think that there's not enough, there's a fear that putting emphasis on that will somehow distract from paying attention to women and girls. That's false in my view, it's zero sum thinking and is doing much, much more harm than good. I would like to eventually get back to the sort of perhaps underlying issues driving the, the fear of highlighting something that could be construed as against the cultural movements and direction in which society is moving. But just back to the attempted suicide rate by women. It's between two and four times higher than that of men. You have to take into account the fact that men are likely to use methods such as firearms, which guarantee fatality. How does this play into your research? Did you take it into account? Is there a psychological explanation that you can perhaps offer? Uh, perhaps men are more deliberate about the outcome they'd like to achieve? Uh, I, again, I, it's... It's hard to say anything with absolute conviction here. I think there are, there are many people who've thought much harder about this than me who still aren't sure. But but for what it's worth, there's a couple of things I would point to. Number one is that men are very much li less likely to be re receiving mental health treatment, about 10 percentage points less likely. So they're less likely to be in at some kind of mental health care. They're also less likely to share, even outside of that, to share emotional problems that they're having. And so to, and very often what happens with a male suicide is that people be like, well, who knew? It comes as a surprise, right? And that's a very different journey to the journey that's more typical of girls and young women where they are more likely to be in care. They are more, it is more like they're more likely to express the fact that they're struggling one way or another. They're more likely to show in one way or another that they're struggling. And that's obviously seen as something like self-harm, which is much more skewed towards girls and young women than, than boys. You know, so it's not a suicide attempt, but it's, it's along that spectrum, if you like, right, from self-harm to suicide attempts that could involve taking some pills of various kinds, 
and parents rush you to the hospital because of you know whatever the pills are they're going to want to be sure and so that of course will be uh, registered as a suicide attempt all the way through up to a completed suicide and so i think there's a bunch of things going on there that mean that that show that a there are different ways in which men and women psychologically express and reveal their mental health problems um and and that means that there's different levels of reporting and so there's evidence, for example, that male depression and female depression just show up a bit differently. Um, but the, we're better at picking up female depression because that's the, that's the coding, that's the training. Uh, most of almost all our psychologists now are women, for example. And so there's just a bit of a tendency, I think, to be able to pick up those signs of it. And as I just said, women are just better in this sense. I think it is better. They are better at showing that they're struggling in one way or, in one way or another. Are the characteristics between the two? ways in which the genders show signs of depression and struggle that you're able to identify at this point? Yeah, again, I'm I'm well outside my area of expertise here, so I, I'm going to stick to just some generalities. But it does seem as if um, there's a difference between like externalizing and internalizing, for example. And so it may well be, so boys are more likely to act out in one way or another, right? And so you might see that through things like disruption, even aggression, perhaps you know some more violence, etc. Um, whereas girls are more like to internalize. Girls and young women are more like to more internalizing. So it's more around self harm. It's more about self self you know, body image, etc. And so very very crudely put, is more of a sense that kind of boys act out, girls turn in more on themselves. So with huge general, that's a huge generalization, of course, and it, it's on average. But but what I think one of the things that means is that sometimes if we see a boy, for example, acting aggressively or being angry, seems irrationally angry, or he gets into a fight at school or he gets suspended, it's like we may not think, oh, perhaps he's depressed, mm-hmm. right? Whereas if a girl is sort of has some self-loathing or body image or self-harm and more like to think that's kind of depression and so we we there's a tendency i think to just dis- to miss the fact that the acting out of boys is sometimes very often underpinned by a mental health problem yeah well him acting out and getting aggressive at school with a classmate for example might be his cry for help in the same way that yes. is exactly exactly perfectly put yes that's exactly right before we get into the why behind the modern male's struggle, can you give me an overview of the underperformance of males? Sure. So in different domains, you see a different story. So in education, for example, there's just a very big gender gap now, and that is international and it's at every level. So in the US, the data I know best there's a bigger gender gap today on college campuses than there was 50 years ago when Title IX was passed to promote the causes of, of, of women. So in 72, when Title IX was passed, a big law to promote women, not just in athletics, people tend to think it was about that, or today they might think it's about assault or something, um, but it was actually a more general law. And at that point, there was about a 16 percentage point gap in favor of men, and now there's an 18 percentage point gap in favor of women. So there's there's just a bigger gender gap today. It's just completely reversed. It's the other way around. So we have slightly higher levels today than we did then. If you can clarify the 16% point gap in favor of men and, well, now in favor of women, um, what exactly do you mean by that? Uh, what I mean by that is that it's basically gone from uh, about sort of 58, 42% split to sort of 59, 50, 59, 41, the other way around. So what I'm t- referring to there is the share of college degrees going to men versus women. So that's not enrollment, uh, that's actual degrees awarded. And the reason I like that is because it's, there's all kinds of differences in whether you enroll, whether you drop out, et cetera. This is just of the degrees that are awarded, what share go to men and to women? Now, of course, there's a relative picture, like more college degrees are being awarded now than 50 years ago. So it's it's not true that fewer men today are getting college degree than 50 years ago. It's just that the relative chances of a man or woman get, have now switched around. So the gender inequalities flip around the other way. And that reflects what happens in high school, where if you take the the students with the highest GPA in high school, the top 10%, two-thirds of them are girls. And the bottom 10%, two-thirds of them are boys with a basically a straight line between. So in terms of high school GPA, the girls are just 
absolutely handing it to the boys in, in the classroom. You know, when two out of three of the top 10% were GPA scorers, that reflects what's happening all the way through the education system. And then when, when you get to the labor market, what we'll see is that between 1979 and 2019, just before the pandemic sort of screwed everything in terms of data, <laughs> um, most men actually saw a decline in, in, most men were actually learning less at the end of that period than most men were at the beginning. So male wages stagnated during that, that period, whereas they went up by about 35% for women. And so we're seeing that kind of real wage stagnation, about 10 million men dropping out of the labor force, falling labor force participation for men, especially less educated men. And so on a bunch of these different, we've already talked about some of the mental health issues. There's, there's a bunch of ways in which boys and men are, have been struggling in recent decades. And again, that's not to say that there aren't also ways in which women and girls are still struggling. So at the top of society, for example, there's still a woeful underrepresentation of women in politics, in boardrooms. Venture capital is you know, famously skewed massively against women. There is still a gender pay gap, largely because of um, caring responsibilities. So there's still huge amounts more to do on the other side, if you like, of this gender inequality question. But that doesn't mean that we can't, we can't do, we, we can do two, two things at once. I've noticed that that is a very significant point that you make when not defending your position in this book, because I must, I mean, I understand that it must have been very, very difficult for me, for example, when deciding to do this interview, I realized that there would be a lot of pushback because immediately when exploring a topic like this, you have to understand that you will be labeled a whole bunch of things. But back to the educational gap between genders, you've argued that the structure and policy around education favors girls and women. When did this start? Like, hmm. what was the timeline? I've, as far as I've read, it's the 1950s, but when was the sort of pivotal upending of societal norms that changed and went into the direction, you know, that we now sit with this crisis? So what's happened in my view is that the system, the education system, was to some extent always a bit more female friendly than male friendly because girls brains develop earlier than boys and so if everyone's the same chronological age that means the girls de developmentally at an advantage to boys and you mentioned the 1950s what one of the things that really struck me looking at the data is that girls were doing slightly better than boys in high school in the 1950s when there was really no incentive for them to do so, right? No one was saying go on to college. Almost no women went to college then. They weren't being told they needed to be educationally independent, get a career. I mean, it was, but they were still slightly ahead. <laughs> and so what that tells me is that even under those conditions, the girls were still doing better, right? And so yeah. that is a strong indication that there was something about the system. And actually, like, you don't need to be a parent or an educator necessarily to know that a 16 year old boy and a 16 year old girl are not quite the same when it comes to the development of particularly organization, future orientation, planfulness, like mm -hmm. getting your homework done type mm -hmm. skills. And that's really what GPA captures, which is why the GPA gap, I think, is so big. Mm -hmm. So I think, so then why why we're only seeing this huge gap opening up in recent years? Well, because of the women's movement. So starting, you know, late 60s, early 70s, there was just this huge, successful, wonderful movement to just break down the barriers that we were putting in front of girls, change the norms, change the laws, change the expectations. And it only took about a decade for women to actually catch up with men on college campuses and then blow right past them. But if you can really, like it took literally about a decade. So what that suggests is that they're just the girls were just already raring to go. And as soon as they were given equal treatment, they turned out to be better. And the reason they're better is because they're more mature. They hit puberty earlier, which means they mature earlier. They're just better students faster, right? We couldn't see that before because we were tamping down the educational opportunities and expectations of women and girls. As soon as we stopped doing that, the line just went up like a rocket. I also think that in some ways, the education system has become more female friendly in recent decades, which is on top of this structural 
um, factor that I just mentioned. Number one, the teaching professions become much more female. So only 23% of teachers in the US now are, are male. And that's down by 10 percentage points since even just since the 80s. So we're seeing fewer and fewer men in our classrooms. And we've also switched away from more vocational forms of learning, more hands-on learning styles towards more book learning styles, more abstract learning styles. Both of those factors seem everything else equal to be better for girls and not so good for boys. So I do think that it's a reasonable claim that overall the education system is now somewhat more female friendly than male friendly. Is it not possible that we are perhaps overestimating the educational advantage in favor of females and not taking into account the fact that men, boys, are more restless, and you have mentioned this, and they will be more likely to be diagnosed with developmental disorders, which I, I mean, I think that this is a big part of a, a broader issue. This identification of a restless boy, just being a boy, mm -hmm. being put on medication, to what extent does that affect the future of his natural brain development? And how has that affected the disparity that we now face? Yeah, so it's it's clearly a factor. What's really hard to un, un, uh, to sort of pick apart there is like where in this vicious cycle, like what's going on here, right? So it's clear that, I mean, by, within K-12 education system, 23% of boys are now diagnosed with some kind of developmental disability. So that's almost one in four. That's twice the rate for girls. And at that point, it can't be right, can it? At what age are they diagnosed with these developmental disorders? So the primary one is ADHD. That's number one. Um, some kind of uh, deficit, attention deficit. Uh, either ADD or ADHD. That's easily the, the most common. Autism is also much, much higher in, in boys. There's, quotes, intellectual disability. Um, and they're diagnosed at different, at different ages. And I don't, I, I should, I don't want to misspeak here um, because the data I know is kind of across the whole of the K-12 system. And so I think they're picked up at different ages. The question then is, like, does it, what's going on there? Are we over-diagnosing this? Is this just, you know, well, that's what boys are like. Are we medicalizing and then medicating what's basically just being a boy yes is it all that no are we actually picking up some real problems that we weren't picking up before yes um and it's very very hard to take that number and know look what how much of that is quotes real how much of it is bias right oh well, he's running around too much he must have ADD, add give him give him a pill um uh, and ha how much of it is just misdiagnosis? So I don't, I don't. No one knows the answer to those questions. But your broader question, which is how much does it matter, I think it's more of a symptom than a cause. I think that that diagnosis and medication that we're seeing is a symptom of the fact that for many boys they just feel like they're a square peg being forced into a round hole. They just don't fit very well into the education system. They don't fit into the teaching style. They don't. It's not comfortable for them, right? It's not a comfortable teaching style. It's not a comfortable environment. They're restless, et cetera. I know I had that issue for sure when I was in school. And so it's like they don't fit, right? And rather than fixing the schools, there's a tendency to try to fix the boy and to try and make him fit into the education system. And of course, to some extent, we have to do that with all children, right? We all have to learn how to, to sit and do so. But we also have to recognize that all children are different. And on this issue, there's quite a big difference between boys and girls. And so... I would much rather we focused on making the schools a bit more boy friendly than trying to make the boys more school friendly, especially if that requires us to medicate them. In what ways would you suggest that we do this? Well, one of my suggestions is that we actually start boys in school a year later. Um, you know, boys mature about a year later. That really shows up in adolescence, but it's true throughout the education system. And so you know, given that there's this big developmental gap, then why not just start, if we start, you know, girls in school at, at four, let's start boys at five. Um, and, and actually, interestingly, in private schools, that's very common. So the, the, the giving a boy an extra year before starting school in private schools is very common. I've really discovered that since writing the book. Uh, and so there's something that the rich people know 
and are benefiting from that not everybody is. But I don't think it should just be rich people that are able to do that. I think public policy should allow more parents to at least have the option to give their boy an extra year of pre-K and let him develop more. And then the other two things relate directly to the problems that I talked about earlier. Number one is I think we need a massive recruitment drive of male teachers. I honestly don't think we can just sit by and watch the teaching profession become a female one and not do anything about it. Or at least we should be honest and say, well, we don't care. But I would love us to have scholarships to get men into teaching. I'd like us to have social marketing campaigns. I'd really like us to try and get more men teaching in our classrooms, not least because of the role models and the signal that sends to the next generation of boys and girls about the kinds of jobs that are appropriate for men and women. You know, I don't, we don't want boys to grow up thinking that education is a women's thing, right? Um, and then the last thing I would do is much bigger investment in apprenticeships and vocational training, more technical high schools, and more opportunities for vocational learning, which is good for a lot of girls as well, but it's especially good for boys. And so that would be a very well, male-friendly way of doing that. So an extra year, more male teachers, and more hands-on learning. Well, you have m made the argument that females in positions of uh, STEM, and this is uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, has increased significantly while men in heels, healthcare, education, administration, and literacy has significantly Fallen. dropped. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's interesting. The lines are going the other way. Yeah. But you argue that it's because that there is government funding and just a bunch of uh, facilitative uh, policies that make it easier for women to get into STEM positions and that there is no such thing for men into heel positions. But surely if men were inclined to want to be in these kinds of professions, what would have been stopping them? Yeah, well, that's the same. That's the same argument that was made by uh, people about women into STEM, and I think this important. So, like, if women want to be doctors or engineers or lawyers, what's stopping them? Um, uh, once we'd removed any sort of legal, now for a while, of course, there were actual barriers, right? Um, but those those were removed relatively early on. So there were some people that said, of course, there should be no legal or formal barriers for women going into those professions. But should we also encourage women into those? Why, why are we spending money on scholarships? Why, are we have, why do we have all these campaigns? Why do we have a she can STEM, picture a scientist? Like, why are, we, what, why are we doing all that? And the reason we did all that was because we knew that it wasn't enough just to say, there's nothing stopping you. We had to recognize the fact that there were a number of things stopping women entering those professions. Not least, you didn't want to be in a tiny minority of women in them not least because the professions were structured in ways that really weren't that helpful, especially to women who perhaps had family responsibilities. The culture of those professions was incredibly male in all kinds of ways. They were not very inviting. So, so we recognize that it's not just the legal and formal barriers, it's the informal barriers, it's the social norms, it's the expectations. And honestly, it is hard to persuade, it was hard to persuade women if they knew they were going to be the one student in the engineering classroom or the one student in the law room, or the one partner in the law firm, you know, the one woman out of 50 men, right? That's a hard thing for women to do. Now, a lot of brave women did it. It took someone to start, but it got a lot easier when it was 30% women. Mm. But to get from none to 30, it took investment and it took, uh, it took a concerted effort from government, philanthropy, society at large. All I'm saying is, can we not do the same to get more men into social work, teaching, psychology, et cetera? I hear you, but what stands out for me is the fact that it was at a much higher rate women were in these kinds of positions and that has decreased. So it's not as if it's never been the case and now it's a novel thing that they need to break into. That's a very, that's a very good point. Um, and I think what that suggests, to, it, it, you're right, that like if you go back to 1980, Actually, a bit more than 50% of psychologists were men. Almost half of social workers were men. 40% of elementary and middle school teachers were men. And that's all, all of those have at least halved in terms of the male share. Nursing has gone up a little bit. So there are a few more men are nurses than before. But all the others, you've seen this big decline. So you're right. It's not like there weren't men in them. These weren't female professions even 40 years ago. So what does that mean? It means that a, it should mean that 
it shouldn't be as hard. We shouldn't have to work quite as hard as we maybe did with women, right? When women had never been lawyers, right? Um, so maybe it means that it'll be a slightly easier lift to get more men into it. But I don't know because once professions become strongly gendered, then it's a little bit harder. And the other thing I would say is that the message to women was these are aspirational jobs. These are, you know, these are powerful jobs, high paid jobs. You, should, you know, there was a real sense of like upward mobility associated with the kinds of jobs that we were talking about for women, right? We weren't asking women to become deep sea fishermen by and large, or the people fixing our electric power lines when they go down, right? Those are still like 90 plus percent male. And there hasn't been a huge effort to get women to go out on fishing fishing boats into the to alaska right why because we don't really care who catches our fish and they're not great jobs in many ways so as one of my female colleagues said to me you can have that one right <laughs> but these other jobs they were quite aspirational whereas i think the problem is that because a lot of the jobs in the heel professions are rightly or wrongly seen as not very aspirational or upwardly mobile it's harder to persuade men that they should do them, right? Healthcare aides, nurses, even psychologists, social workers, right? That's not the same as scientist, lawyer, et cetera. So I think we have to be honest about that. And that means that we should pay those professions a lot better anyway, regardless. Um, but it also, I think, means that we have to tackle the status of those professions. Um, to the extent that they're seen as lower status, it's harder to get anyone into them. And by the way, some of those professions are now struggling to attract women as well as men. So this problem is only going to get worse. Just on the point of uh, fishermen and those kinds of jobs, critics of the book have argued that you've adopted the second wave of feminism and that your position in respect of gender equality ignores the fundamental differences between what makes a man and what makes a woman. You also stated that highlighting these differences between men and women signal inequality well i think the question is how fundamental are they right and and i think that the the divide is between on the one hand the the extreme views on this are that this they are very fundamental differences and that the differences are so deep uh and so consequential that they should affect, for example, the roles that men and women should be encouraged or discouraged from adopting in society, right? So women are a little bit more into people, men are more into things. So women shouldn't, should not be engineers and men should not be nurses, right? That's a very strong version of that view. Um, the other extreme view is there are no differences between men and women except the ones that are socially constructed. And so the only reason that men are a bit more into things and math and stuff and that women are a bit more into relationships is because they've been told to be that way from birth. And so until we get to 50-50 in every occupation, every, every profession, then we'll still know that we're all in the grip of a patriarchy, right? Both of those positions are, to use a technical term, crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's obviously true that there are some differences on average between men and women but it's equally obviously true that the distributions overlap very significantly and so i'll make it personal my sister-in-law is an engineer my son is an early years educator on average you're going to see somewhat fewer women in engineering a decent estimate from the literature is that maybe 30 percent of engineers will be women not 50 right because because of this difference but it's not 5%, which is what it was a few years ago. And it's not 15%, which it is now. And on average, more women are going to be early as educators, right? Working with very small children, right? But it's probably 25%, 20% will be male. Right now, it's 3%. So my son is one of 3% of the male share in early as education. Now, you can either look at those numbers and say, you see, men and women are different. Or you can say, yeah, but they're not that different. And that's where most people are. I think most of us recognize there are differences, differences on average. Should they affect what people are encouraged to do? You know, is journalism a male job or a female job? I don't know. I don't care. Law, medicine. Decade we're asking for this. Right. I mean, it's crazy, right? It is being a think tank. Like, I'm in a think tank. I'm a guy. You're a journalist. You're a woman, right? Could we? I was a journalist. You could work in a think tank. Right? So there are lots of professions where it's literally irrelevant. 
But there are some where you might say, yeah, okay, those jobs are probably a bit more likely to be male. Like the deep sea fishing is, I'm sure the deep sea fishing is always going to be a more male profession. And I don't care. And I don't think anyone should really care. But there are other jobs like politician, CEO, journalist, where we should care. Do you not think that it's this push towards gender equality that has played a significant role in the emasculation of men where they found themselves making a difference in certain roles that now no longer are reserved for them. And I don't mean that in like the very, very narrow sense of the word, just the nuclear family. It feels as if this push towards gender equality and almost to a certain extent ignorance of male and female inherently like, you know, biological roles that we play are dissolving and to a certain extent desecrating the value of the nuclear family and that that may play a role in the loss of identity that um, men are experiencing. Well, um, I certainly think that the... Um, the alteration in the nuclear family from a world where it was based on a very clear division of labor and very clear economic dependency, a breadwinner male, a caring female, and children. And the female and the children were dependent on the male. The success of the women's movement of breaking that chain of dependency between the woman and the man by helping women to become economically independent has had dramatic consequences for the way we think about families. Now, good or bad? And the answer is mostly good, some bad. It is good that we don't have half the population economically dependent on the other. It is good that women have the same economic opportunities as men to be think tankers, journalists, lawyers. That's good. But the bad thing about it is that it now has destabilized identity and especially for men. So for women, they've added to their identity. So they've they're, they're mothers, but they're also journalists or lawyers or whatever, right? So they've expanded the set of roles that they can fill. It's been expansive. It's been upwardly mobile. They've gained independence. They've massively gained economic power. So today, 40% of women earn more than the typical man. Now, in 79, it was 13% of women, right? Okay. Now, that's not 50%. Yeah, it's not 50%. If we had absolute gender equality, it'd be 50%. But still, 40% of women earn more than the median man now, right? That's a completely different world to just 30, 40 years ago, completely different world. And so that raises the question, what's the distinct male role? If the distinct male role used to be provider and women don't need providers anymore, even when they're raising children, are men necessary? What about the men? Now that's a really important question and one that we're only just beginning to answer. But the answer is definitely not to go back 50 years or blame feminism or see the women's movement as anything other than the glorious liberation movement that it was. But it seems as if the liberation of women has been conflated with pushing the independence agenda so far that women can have children, have a career, no man is needed, and then that essentially leads to what you call the dad deficit. Well, it leads to that. It leads to the, it can lead to the dad deficit, but it doesn't have to. And it can lead to millions of men feeling completely lost and purposeless, like they've lost the old role, but they haven't got a new one yet. It can lead to deaths of despair, suicide, alcoholism. Um, you know, deaths in men account for seven, you know, two thirds of drug overdoses, et cetera. It can lead to all kinds of problems for men, but it doesn't have to. But we shouldn't just expect this massive change to not have consequences that we need to deal with. And so like the conservative view here is told you so, we warned you this would happen, which they did in the 70s when they argued against the women's movement, right? There were lots of books from conservatives saying if women get economic independence, the men will be in deep trouble. Um, they were right about that. But what we can do is help men to adjust to this world because you, you don't need 
your wife or the mother of your children to be economically dependent on you for you to be a good father. That's, but that's, that's, that's a big transition. If the role of father was to be the provider, if that was the principal way he saw him executing his role as a father, then we're in real trouble because men don't have that unique role anymore. They can still do that. And a lot of men do. Don't get me wrong. A lot of men are providing. I'm providing for my family as it happens right now. And, and that's great. But we don't have unique access to it. There have been years where my wife was providing for our family. And she certainly could if she chose to. So what it means is that we have to rethink the relationships between fathers and children so that they're direct and they don't rely on the relationship with the mum. Not that men shouldn't be with the mother of their children. I'm not arguing that. But I'm saying they won't always be. And most importantly, women will no longer be trapped in a relationship of economic dependency with men. And that is a good thing with some difficult consequences for men. And again, part of the problem with this debate is you can't. it's hard to say that. It's hard to say. We've had this great change, but it's had all these potential downsides. Sometimes our debate, our political debate especially, is conducted as if you can in fact make an omelette without breaking any eggs. And you can never make an omelette without breaking eggs. And so we just need to be responsible enough to recognize that even positive social changes, if they're big, like the rise of women, can have destabilizing social byproducts, especially for men. And just accept that and to do something about it without thinking that means you're in any way anti-feminist or anti-women or wanting to go back. But right now, people feel they have to choose between those two agendas. You're either in favor of women and nothing to see here for boys and men, or you're worried about boys and men and it's the fault of women and feminism. And that's an absurd choice. So if I'm understanding you correctly, then the sort of crux of the matter is that men need to navigate towards finding a new identity which is not the breadwinner the provider they need to become comfortable with a woman perhaps being the primary breadwinner perhaps being the stay-at-home dad what are your recommendations going forward considering what a complex situation and issue we <laughs> are discussing there's no it's not one size fits all Right. So we, we've mentioned some of them already, which is improve the education system so they have more skills um, and uh, try and encourage more men into the, the professions that are growing fastest, like health, education, etc., and have more vocational training for all those other jobs that we still need. But in terms of family, especially, I do think this is the heart of the matter, which is this sense of purpose and engagement and feeling needed. One thing I'm absolutely certain of is that it is a universal human need to be needed. And too many men right now don't feel needed. And the question is then, is how can they feel needed in a new way? Because they're not just going to be needed for the paycheck anymore. Again, not that they won't earn or, or support their families, but it's not that can't, you can't put all your eggs in that basket from an identity point of view. But as fathers, their role, I think, remains even more as important and probably even more important than before. And so that means a couple of things. One is it means that fathers should get paid leave on exactly the same basis as mothers do and that it should be available to them throughout their children's lives because I'm reasonably convinced by the evidence that when children are very young, actually there is a preference for mums to be at home with very young children, right? A six-month-old, say, right? <laughs> on average, not yeah. that some men won't do that, but on average, when I see that it's more likely to be mums at home with, with very small children than dads, I don't assume that's sexism, especially, by the way, when it's mostly true of people with Harvard PhDs. Yeah, I think, that's, you'd have to, I think you have to be really, really committed to the idea that everything's socialized, not to think that mums want to be with their three-month-old baby or six-month-old baby. But I'm also convinced by the evidence that actually when the kids get older, and especially as they approach teenage years, et cetera, that dads really come into their own. And if anything, dads might have a bit of an advantage. And so why not a world where maybe mums do a bit more of the tots and dads do a bit more of the teens? But my, more importantly, they have the choice. So my brother, for example, he has boys, he has twin boys. He's a doctor in the UK. And he took his leave when they started high school. 
because he thought that was a great time to be around, that transition into high school for his boys. And it was a great time to be around. And so the point is that it takes a long time and men and women can play different roles at different points in that journey. So paid leave should be available to uh, both men and women. And we should change our workplaces so that that's you know, seen as something that's appropriate. We don't. The point is that we don't need androgyny to have equality. We don't need to wipe away the differences between men and women in order for men and women to be equal. And that's the, the problem right now is that too many people have convinced us that it's either equality with androgyny or it's back to the 50s. And instead, we're all trying to figure out a way to be men and women, but in a world where men and women are quite rightly equals and figuring it out together. And the, the real moment we've got to get to is this acknowledgement that we rise together. A world of floundering men is unlikely to be a world of flourishing women or vice versa. We need a world where we're all flourishing. And that means boys and girls, men and women rising together. What does this mean for romantic relationships between men and women? How does that play into men finding a new space in which they feel they belong? in which they can grow, in which they can have purpose, and where women can feel that they are no longer trapped in the same neat boxes that they were in the 50s and prior there to. Well, I, I think the whole, I mean, first of all, we're seeing very interesting patterns now in romantic relationships. Obviously, there's a so-called sex recession. That's Kate Julian's term from the Atlantic, so actually less sex. Okay. Um Americans in their 20s are having less sex than in previous generations, yeah. Um, uh, a lot more loneliness. 15% um, uh, of young American men don't have a friend. Uh, and just a bit of a decline from some of that romantic um, that romantic journey that we've seen historically. And obviously there's some good, good news in there about independence and education. But I think that actually in some ways romance is a good test of the the thesis that we just discussed, which is, can we be different but equal? Yes. Um, because I do think there's a kind of sense in which there is, you know, over over the millennia, human beings have developed various rituals and institutions to sort of make it work between men and women as they go about this difficult task of finding a mate. And we should be really careful not to just throw all that away. Um, and what I've discovered actually is that, particularly among mums, when the, if they have girls who are school age, they don't they don't really get no they don't know what I'm talking about right. If they only have daughters, they're like well they don't see that boys are struggling in school because they don't have boys. And also because their daughters are probably driving them completely nuts. It, 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 exactly. So it's a different thing. They're like, what are you talking about? Like you try having teenage kids. and and because as we said earlier, teenage girls are struggling in various ways. But I've noticed that the mums who have daughters in their twenties, or in fact women who are in their twenties are suddenly more alert to my arguments again because they're thinking, wait, who's my daughter going to marry or have a relationship with or have kids with? Where are the guys that I would feel good about? Uh, and so suddenly they're starting to worry about it again. And so we have to be very careful to create an environment where you know the men do feel good about themselves. They're not afraid. They're not in retreat. They're not... I have this quite deep fear that we have a generation of men who have been told a lot of things that they can't do, yeah. but not many things they should do. A long list of don'ts, not very many do's. It seems to me that one of these don'ts is not to be a man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. Well, most, I mean, actually, there's a new, there's a new, there's a new survey out this week, which, which shows you that like most American men, you know, think that men get punished for acting like men. Um, and, and, and what's, what we have to do here is find a way to retain the aspects of masculinity that are positive, but distinct. And so, for example, like the, the degree to which like, men are a little bit more likely to say to ask a girl out than the other way around. That's okay. That's not just okay, it's natural and good. And we, we mustn't make men feel like there's something wrong with them um, if they do that or they're at risk of some kind of reprimand or reaction. And so 
the danger is that in, in our laudable attempts to make sure that we have gender equality um, and a world where men and women are absolute equals in all important respects is that we somehow make masculinity the problem. And masculinity is not the problem, nor is femininity. Um, and so we have to, we've, we've, we're in danger just on that specific issue of, particularly when it comes to things like maybe sex and romance, like almost kind of making men feel bad about themselves. And men who feel bad about themselves, back to where we started, are more likely to have mental health problems, commit suicide, etc. But they're also, they don't make great partners either. You know, they're not the kinds of men that most women want to be with. Men, where women, women want to be with men who've got their act together, who've got agency, who've got plans, who've got purpose, who've, you know, who 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 are setting about life with a full sail. Um, not men who are sitting on their hands, worried they're going to say or do the wrong thing. And so, uh, it's a difficult moment. I'm sure we'll get through it, um, but we won't get through it by making men or women feel like there's something intrinsically wrong with them. One of the big lessons of the women's movement was. If women are struggling, don't say it's because there's something wrong with them. Don't say it's because they're not assertive enough or they're not wearing shoulder pads or they're not standing the right way or they're wearing too much lipstick or not enough lipstick or they shouldn't. Don't stop blaming the women, right? Just change the systems and the culture and have a pro-women movement, have a, have a movement that's joyful about femininity and insistent on equality. We need exactly the same sentiment towards men that's joyful about men and masculinity, um, but also committed to gender equality. And right now, the whole debate about masculinity is fraught. It's either alt-righty, acting out, kind of old-style masculinity, or it's cramped, apologetic, uh, sort of retreating masculinity. And i got to tell you, as someone that's raised three boys and is a man myself, neither of those are the model we want for our sons. <laughs>